rhetoric. And in this, and in this paper, we want to um, think about whether governments can better assign their workers essentially, and how that might be a source of state uh, effectiveness that is underutilized, especially in uh, developing countries with pretty low state capacity. So the, the motivation is that, you know, these assignment margins are quite important in the private sector, both the assignment of workers to different postings or different tasks, and also the assignment uh, of workers into teams, so pre team creation. And so I think there's good reason to think this would also hold in the public sector. For one, uh, public sector managers are a bit constrained in how they can increase performance of their workers in sort of traditional ways used in the private sector. So, you know, it's not possible to hire just anybody. You have to sort of rely on certain rules and regulations, often based on sort of uh, an examination system. Um, there's promotion, which may be, you know, again, only kind of weakly tied to performance, uh, seniority, grade based promotion, uh, often firing constraints are really severe in the public sector. So you just can't even fire people who are behaving, you know, are having very low performance. Um, so for all those reasons, I think, you know, how you assign your existing bureaucrats, your existing civil servants is a sort of attractive margin for uh, the public sector manager to try to increase performance. Moreover, there's uh, several recent empirical papers that find that the individuals who make up the state end up explaining a large share of the variation in government performance across space and uh, time. So just looking at sort of you know, bureaucrat fixed effects, basically, and these explain up, you know, somewhere between 10 and 25% of variation in outcomes, in different, different types of government uh, performance outcomes. So this raises the possibility that the assignment of bureaucrats could be a useful tool to increase performance. And importantly, this is one that may be uh, costless in the sense that you're doing better with the people you already have. So you don't have to hire you know, new people or you know, assign, you know, pay higher wages or something like this. So we study this question, this topic in the context of tax collection in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in the context of a property tax campaign with several field experiments embedded into it in 2018. This takes place in the city of Kananga in the DRC. The experiment we study has two different stages of random assignment that we will use to study uh, optimal assignment. So the first is the assignment of 34 different tax collectors into two um, person teams. So they get re reassigned every month uh, for a six month campaign into new teams. So we sort of reshuffling these teams every, every month. And then those teams are then randomly assigned to different neighborhoods throughout the city. And there are a total of 180 neighborhoods, um, which span uh, just shy of 2000 properties. So we use those two dimensions of random assignment then to, uh, to try to uh, estimate the return to optimally uh, reassigning these tax collectors. So how do we do this? The first step is to come up with some sort of estimate for collector and household type. Um, so we're following much of the recent sort of matching literature, which is often in an education space. Um, we're applying that here to this tax collection space. So for household types, which you can think of as sort of low and high um, propensity to pay the, the property tax, we will rely on the predictions of locally embedded leaders known as city chiefs who will, before the tax campaign, predict the ability to pay of every single um, property owner. Then to come up with a similar, you know, collector low or high based on their uh, propensity to collect taxes, that's basically how we want to think about collector type. We will use a sample splitting approach and estimate a fixed effects uh, model leveraging that random assignment of different collectors. Once we have our estimates for household and collector type, we're in a position to estimate the expected tax compliance function, uh, which is basically the, you know, the probability of tax compliance conditional on the match type uh, of the households and the two collectors. Yeah, I see a question. Uh, Naman? Yeah, Naman. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, uh, so the tax collector is going to be the head of a two-person team, two team, right? 
uh, they're they're pretty much equal peers. So there's two there's two people, two tax collectors in each team, and they don't there's not really one head or another one who's a subordinate. They're equal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So once we've estimated this tax compliance function, we can then basically plug those estimates into um, uh, our optimization problem and search over all different possible assignments, uh, basically a probability mass function, to find the one that would maximize uh, tax compliance or maximize tax revenue, depending on what we choose as the government's uh, maximum. And then once we have the optimal assignment, we can then compare it to the status quo uh, assignment, which in our case is random assignment, to get the estimates of the impact uh, of this counterfactual optimal assignment. So to give you a little bit of a preview, we find that the optimal assignment in this setting involves positive assertive matching on both dimensions um, of our assignment. So on the collector to collector dimension, it's better to form teams of just high collectors and just uh, low collectors reflecting a complementarity. And then there's also a complementarity on the collector team to household dimension. So it's uh, optimal for the government to assign those high ability teams to high type households, and likewise with low type teams and low type households. We provide some evidence that the mechanism that underpins this, these complementarities and this positive assortative matching is the fact that these high ability uh, collector teams exert more effort when they're paired with other high ability uh, teammates. And that basically they solve a, a coordination problem that enables them to collect for more hours and therefore relax uh, the cash on hands constraints that are very common in the context of property tax collection. And that, that increases overall tax compliance. So I'll go into that, of course, in much more depth. For the effects the, of this counterfactual optimal assignment, we estimate this would increase tax compliance by about 37% relative to the uh, status quo, the, the random assignment. Um, and we try to benchmark this, the magnitude here, by looking at other possible counterfactual policies. Uh, so one is just a, re, a sort of reshuffling of work uh, from low ability to high ability collectors. So the government would have to replace 63% you know, of those low ability collectors. Um, or it would need to raise uh, collectors' performance wages by about uh, 69%, both of which are very large. And um, you know, there's other reasons why they may not be uh, you know, useful in, in, in practice. Uh, yeah, Tushar? Yeah, so quick question. So this is all assuming that the tax collectors have a single objective function, which is to maximize the tax compliance, right? Yeah. So it could be that there are other responsibilities that they have, and then you reshuffle them. There are some general equilibrium things. They, they are compromising on other objectives to get this done. Right? So this yeah. is the max bound, right? High upper bound. Um, the well, they're not. These tax collectors are hired very specifically for this um, this tax campaign. So they're they're drawn from a pool of contractors who do these types of projects for the government. Um, pretty common for like frontline workers and these types of campaigns in Congo and other developing countries. Um, but I guess your point is maybe in a, in a more general setting where you had a tax collector who's doing this in addition to other tasks. Um, yeah, we'll, we're going to look at some, like how time constrained they are, uh, which I think is one way to look at your question. So are they running out of time at the end of the month? Um, are they, you know, in larger neighborhoods where you have exogenously a larger share of households to visit? Do they do fewer overall visits, which would suggest their time constraint? We don't find much evidence of that. Um, so I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a sort of a binding constraint for them. Um, and I'll also come back and think about a few other sort of general equilibrium issues that could, could result when you try to implement this thing in practice. So um, yeah, thanks I, for that question. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. Uh, just to come back to uh, uh, the basics, I, I guess I could ask this question to Sean as well. I mean, why we need people called tax collectors? Uh, um, uh, you know, in in the advanced economies, we have people issued uh, firms and and so forth will, will be issued with a tax notice. Um, if they don't pay, then there is some enforcement process that subsequently takes place. Um, uh, I'm wondering here what the role of the tax collector is. Is the collector somebody who is in a position to enforce? Um, uh, my sense is that, that one thing you haven't mentioned so far is 
but corruption in these situations must be um, uh, must be rife. I mean, you um, yeah. you, know, you give me a payoff of so much, uh, and then I'll reduce the um, amount that uh, needs to be collected from you, so long as we have a mutual arrangement that will satisfy my boss. Right. So yeah, um, this kind of problem would seem to be pretty serious um, uh, in what you're looking at. Uh, and whether when you, you when you classify these workers as being high performance or low performance, really, I mean, uh, you know, what is, is is that a measure of the extent of their loyalty to the state and therefore the general principle of tax collection, uh, and therefore a measure of their not being corrupt? Um, yeah. Or yeah. is it is it the the, the 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 zealousness with which they approach their job? I mean, my. Yeah. In many developing countries, in fact, has been that bureaucrats, uh, for their standard salary, they might show up, but they don't actually do anything unless yeah. additional funds are allocated. Uh, yeah, that's right. Here too. That's a really Sorry, that's a long interesting question. Yeah. No, it's a good question. There's a lot of interesting parts there. Um, I think uh, these types of, I mean, the, the general first answer, I think, is that because there's so little, the, the economy is so informal and there's so much, so little sort of third party information available, it's really hard to do tax enforcement in the same way as in a rich country. So yes, a lot of, you know, poor countries, uh, especially ones like Congo, where you have, you know, very low income per capita, very informal economy, um, they do rely on these types of field-based collector approaches. Um, now they are subject to all those kind of principal agent issues you raised, um, and corruption is a major concern. Corruption, you know, the prevention of collusion between both collectors, uh, you know, each other and collectors and households was part of the rationale for why the government has been, you know, randomizing the assignments in the first place. So that's why the status quo does involve randomization, and that's kind of common if you look historically at, you know, the use of field-based. Uh, agents as you want to sort of move them around, right? Sort of reshuffle them um, to prevent these types of collusive arrangements. So, be, so being, you know, cognizant of, of bribes and whatnot is, is crucial. Um, I'll look at that as an outcome and I'll show that the policy, you know, should not increase the number of bribes per visits. Um, and so most of the mechanism that we're going to look at has to do with this sort of effort margin where these uh, these high ability types, what, what it seems to come down to is um, simply exerting more effort. Um, and whether that means they're sort of more aligned with taxation, I think that's a really interesting point. I think it's hard to get at. I believe we do find, in fact, so when we look at just like what are the raw uh, characteristics of high type tax collectors, so they're more educated, they're slightly higher incomes, and they do have slightly higher tax morale in the sense they think that tax is more important for the government. So mm -hmm. So I think that may be consistent with your intuition, but we don't see, basically we don't see too much going on the bribe uh, margin. It seems to be more that like some, some people are just more likely to show up and do, their, do the work properly as they were supposed to. Uh, and those, are, those are end up being the high types. And what's kind of interesting is when, they, when you have two high types together, um, they reinforce each other. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, I, evidence I, I accept that. that that's a really important uh, point. Um, I'm wondering though, whether these tax collectors, the successful ones are also extremely large and powerful and possibly carrying weapons or something or other. I mean, there is oh. a sense in which they are enforcers here, aren't they? Yeah, they, I mean, so they're definitely not uh, carrying weapons and they're not intimidating people so much. It's, I think this context, so they, just to give you some, you know, um, some context, they, you know, average compliance is, is 10% of properties that pay the tax. So it's very low. So they don't have, they're not doing force, you know, they're not going around with a policeman or something like that. As I, I think if anything, this is sort of, if there's some continuum between, you know, kind of purely enforced compliance and voluntary compliance, it's closer to the voluntary compliance side of things. Um, although the, you know, the beliefs of people about the, you know, probability of enforcement are really important. And we'll look at that as a mechanism as well. Um, yeah, so okay, thanks for thanks that. Very, much. very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think Simon had a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think my questions relate, uh, just to follow up uh, Ra's question, and I have this uh, questions from the very beginning that, you know, what's the uh, the source of this inefficient collection in the first place? But mm -hmm. you, since you mentioned that, the, you know, the, the purpose of this government's random assignment is to prevent some corruption or, 
mm-hmm. or whatnot. Uh, so I I wonder. So so you you also have your own random assignment, but just you know pair with different abilities and and whatnot. Uh, but this experiment um, doesn't really give you a view about what's going to happen in the long run. In a sense that mm-hmm. you know. Because I would say uh, corruption are more likely to occur if you give more time for the collector and people or the taxpayer to develop relationship. Yeah. Okay. So, so from this perspective, I can see there's a good point from the government's approach to random assign uh, these yeah. assi- uh, collectors because that kind of break down uh, yeah. their chance to be able to collect uh, collect a uh, relationship in the long run. So, so yeah. what's your view about the th- these results that you get, uh, this pair between collectors of different abilities, and how that uh, affect my work in the long run? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, the the policy we are evaluating is not to uh, you know form teams forever and then uh, abandon the logic of reshuffling. So the, the basically it would still involve reshuffling, but just among the high types, if that makes sense. So you would you would you know you would form these teams optimally, and then you would still each month reshuffle people and reshuffle them to households. So you'd preserve that kind of collusion proofing benefit, while also improving match type. Um, so in that sense, it should I think, and even in the long run, it should sort of address the concern you're, you're raising, if that makes sense. Okay. I think uh, Yan Ri had a question. Yeah, right. Uh, I missed a couple of slides, so did, I don't know whether you cover or not. Is, the, the, the definition of abilities really are very ambitious, uh, ambiguous here, uh, depending on how, what it refers to. Uh, I say uh, 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 two issues. One, so if I, uh, I'm a high, I'm a collector with a high ability. Why should I work with a, I don't know, someone with low ability? Right? What's my incentive? Second one, to use my ability to collect more tax, right? And also the uh, what were training and other factors play in this? Sorry, the second question was about training. Yeah, or well, they, they, they are again back to the definition of ability. So you say, yeah. if, I assume it reflects experience and training in a tax collection, right? Yeah, yeah. And also the proper incentive, if I'm capable, but uh, I get the yeah. same pay with someone with, with someone with low capability. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great, great point. Um, so ability here, we're gonna define in a very kind of reduced form way where we just, it's it's sort of the, the tax, your ability to collect taxes. So it's, so quite literally, it's the average level of tax compliance we observe you as having achieved across a set of randomly assigned neighborhoods that you were assigned to. So that's that's how we'll quite literally measure ability. Um, but so the, the 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 idea about you know well maybe being paired with a low ability type sort of weakens my incentive because I share the uh, the bonus. So they're actually paid in such a way that um, they it should be somewhat impervious to that. Um, they're supposed to um, alternate between properties um, who actually uh, collects the, the money and then they are paid a bonus, which is proportional to the amount that they collect. So to some degree, the incentives are um, stronger than you, know, you might have expected. Um, uh, that said, we observe very few people in practice collecting a loan. They tend to have a really strong preference for working together in teams for various reasons I can go into. Uh, one of which is that there's actually potentially sort of uh, a level of sa- a safety issue of carrying around a bunch of money while you're walking through these neighborhoods in Congo. So it actually, they, they feel sort of more secure being in teams of two. Um, and that's common in a lot of settings. Collectors teams, uh, collectors seem to work in teams of two and in, in, in places where you have frontline workers doing uh, tax collection. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that was, oh, and the training, yeah, training where I can't really say, tell you too much about training now, uh, but one thing we can do is look at experience uh, because we have the um, month by month uh, structure of this uh, campaign. So collectors are gonna be reshuffled into the new teams every single month. We can basically look at how they learn over time and whether being paired with a high ability collector in the past means you're more effective in the future uh, and how that varies by collector type. So we'll, we can get into some sort of learning um, 
issues, which has to do, I think, a little bit with how you become better and, 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 and sort of what the underlying mechanism is behind uh, collector performance. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Girish. Um, hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi. Sorry to uh, get back on the corruption issue. Uh, but so what I understand what you're saying was that uh, the extent of corruption is kind of orthogonal to uh, the collector type, right? The high type or the low type, which should kind of make your uh, estimates unbiased, which is fine. Uh, but I was thinking, even if, you know, we think about an alternative strategy where we think about uh, high type collectors having the ability to better decipher uh, the extent of tax evasion in the provinces or the areas that they are assigned to. And through that, first of all, they are able to, uh, you know, get more tax uh, to kind of signal themselves as more efficient bureaucrats but also probably get more uh, you know, bang uh, for the buck in the sense that they can also get more money through bribes and corruption as well. So even, in, even if that's true in the sense that you know, corruption is positively related to uh, the ability of uh, the bureaucrat, even in that case, what you're finding is probably a lower bound in the sense that the benefit that you're finding, the 37% increase in tax compliance, that probably still will, will be a, a lower bound. Um, is, is what I was thinking. It's not necessarily a problem for you, is it? Even if it's correlated with ability in, in, in the sense that you'd expect it to be. I see. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I'm not, I, I wasn't as, uh, I wasn't following as clearly on what you were saying about sort of signaling future rent extraction, but, but the, the piece that, um, you know, we definitely do find in the data is if you look at overall rates of bribes. Um, it is true that the high types collect slightly higher, more bribes. But then what we do is look at bribes per visit and looking at bribes per visit, you find uh, no increase at all. So basically, you know, higher bribes is a mechanical increase of their higher effort level, which I think is maybe what you were getting at. Um, and so if the government is, is happy living with a, a certain, you know, rate of bribery per tax collection visit, then in fact, you know, we don't have to worry about the, the bribe results very much at all. I, I think that was your sort of intuition. Exactly, right? exactly. In the okay. sense that even, yeah. if, even if the ability yeah. type is positively correlated with the amount yeah. of bribe they can extract, even then your results are kind of lower amount. That's what I understand. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so unless there's further questions. Um, so what, what literatures are we hoping to contribute to here? Well, first of all, the kind of growing literature about uh, bureaucrats as a source of state effectiveness, especially in developing countries. Um, most of this literature has looked at kind of selection, incentives, monitoring, um, and there's limited evidence on the assignment margin. So here we find, uh, we look at the random assignment of public sector workers, which is relatively uncommon. Usually these are sort of, you know, AKM mover design style papers. Um, we also can look at two dimensions of assignment, so both the assignment to teams and then um, to postings. We have relatively clear performance um, outcomes, you know, the amount of tax, the amount of bribes, uh, the number of visits. Uh, these are, you know, in this literature, that those are pretty clear performance um, outcomes since bureaucrat effectiveness is hard to quantify often. And we have pretty rich survey data that we can use to look at um, mechanisms. Similarly, a contribution in the sort of literature on optimal tax administration in developing countries, uh, where there, again, has been sort of less work on the assignment margin, and we can here, you know, show that this seems to be a pretty reasonable policy that shouldn't increase uh, administrative costs, um, but could increase compliance. Um, uh, and so that's a, attractive in a, in a sort of developing country, uh, low state capacity context. Finally, for the optimal matching literature itself, um, most of this work is based on sort of the education context and often it only has one level of assignment. So here we have these two different uh, level of, levels of assignment. And one thing that I think is kind of neat is we can do our full, our full analysis with just each individual uh, assignment level. And we find that that would have the policies impact. So both dimensions of our assignment seem to contribute roughly equally to the overall estimated impact of, of this um, optimal assignment. Okay, so to jump into a little bit to the, the, the setting. So this is all based in the city of Kananga. Um, this is the fourth uh, largest city 
in Congo with a population of over 1 million, 1 to 2 million, somewhere in there. Uh, hard, to, hard to know exactly given the, the level of government statistics. Um, it's a very poor context, so median household income is about um, $106 per month. So this is a very low capacity state with near zero uh, formal tax compliance. So the, just to give you a, a sense, in 2015, the provincial tax revenue was about three, um, 30 cents uh, per person per year. So sort of staggeringly low. You can try to imagine what kind of public goods you could provide with, with that kind of a budget. Um, so what is the government trying to do? Well, it's turning to the property tax, uh, which currently accounts for about a quarter of provincial tax revenue. And I think this is very consistent with sort of international best practices among tax experts. It's, you know, it's thought to be an efficient tax. Uh, it's potentially easy to tax since it's levied on an immobile visible asset. Um, so for a low capacity state, you know, it could make sense. Uh, there's also, you know, Africa is the most rapidly urbanizing continent uh, in, on earth. And so there's large increases in urban property values um, that are currently not going, not getting taxed just as there's large you know, increases in demand for, uh, urban public goods and amenities. Um, but it's actually the single most underexploited tax in relative terms as a share of GDP uh, when you look at low versus high income countries. So the government started really systematically collecting property taxes in 2016 um, with uh, these door-to-door -door tax collection campaigns like we were talking about previously, um, but it is still quite strained in overall uh, tax compliance around 10%. And so the government's trying to see what it can do to increase uh, tax compliance from there. The property tax in this setting is looks different than it would in a, a high income country. So it's a fixed annual fee, um, a very simplified instrument, um, which is common when you don't have in developing countries where you don't have some kind of existing property valuation role. Um, so there's two different value bands. The low value band is about 90% of properties and properties are taxed about $2, uh, two US dollars per year. And the high value band where it's about nine US dollars per year. Um, so here just gives you a, an example of the two types of uh, properties. Um, the low, ba low value band is defined as those built in out of mud bricks and the high value band is built out of sort of more modern materials like concrete. Um, and so just to be clear, this is not the same as low and high type houses. So these value bands, it's, it's a little unfortunate. They're also called low and high types, but this is purely about the, the tax um, amount, the, the amount of liability. And then we're gonna do our estimation of the, uh, the types of the um, households, uh, but that will be uh, related to their uh, propensity to pay the tax, not the, uh, the level of the tax, not the, the, the liability. So if you look at this as a rate, it may seem like a very small uh, numbers, but this ends up being about 0.34% of property value, which is not so far off from you know, what, what certain US states um, have for their property tax. If, um, if households or properties do not pay the tax, then there is a fine of uh, 1.5X plus the arrears, um, and you could ultimately get some into court and whatnot. Um, so that's the official sort of enforcement um, but in practice for these types of kind of residential property owners, this is uncommon. Um, but of course, beliefs are going to be, you know, uh, going to vary and be quite important in, as a mechanism for, um, for, for uh, compliance. So how does this property tax campaign work in a little bit more detail? Um, so there's two stages of the, of the, of the tax campaign. Um, and uh, teams are, collectors are always working in teams of two. Um, so the uh, first um, uh, step of the property tax campaign is to construct a property uh, register. So there's no existing valuation role. So they have to literally go through and sort of identify who are the properties that uh, should be taxed. Um, so they assess the tax liability, as I was just saying in the previous slide, based on the, the building material. And then they issue unique tax IDs and tax letters explaining the amount that's due, et cetera. And then after the property register step, then they go back and make what I'm going to call tax visits. And these are in-person appeals where they directly solicit payment of the tax and they will collect the money um, then and there and issue receipts using handheld receipt payers to, uh, to, to those who actually pay the, uh, the tax. Um, so you can see that this type of property tax collection, going back to our earlier discussion, it leaves a lot of discretion up to the individual uh, collector. Um, so the effort level, the types of um, uh, you know, tactics and, and messages used to try to convince people to pay, 
all of that depends on the uh, on the collectors, which I think just you know motivates an under an investigation uh, into collectors and how assignment might uh, impact overall tax revenue. Who are the tax collectors? Well, they are contractors um, hired to uh, work on this uh, tax campaign. Uh, there's 34 of them. Um, so you can think of these as sort of like bureaucrats in waiting. And again, this is pretty common in, in a lot of developing countries where you can't afford a large staff. So you uh, have a pool of frequent contractors who you sort of draw on when you're doing a big vaccination push, you know, land registration drive, uh, prop, you know, tax campaign, something like this. Um, they are on average uh, 30 years old, 94% male, and 70% uh, have university education. Um, and they will receive a piece rate uh, compensation, um, with, which is uh, basically a share of how much they, uh, they bring home, how much they collect, as I sort of referred to um, earlier. So what's the status quo? What is the assignment that will compare our optimal assignment to? Well, as I said before, it's this two-stage random assignment. So every month we randomly form new teams of two, and then those teams of two are going to be randomly assigned uh, to, to neighborhoods. So each month of the six-month campaign, they'll work in two different neighborhoods, and then how they allocate their time between the two neighborhoods is left um, up to them. Um, we will we have balance tests to show that these different randomizations worked, and they, they do achieve a, a high degree of balance. So the median tax collector will work with six different teammates over the course of the tax campaign corresponding to each month. And then they'll work in about 12 different neighborhoods. Um, again, two neighborhoods per month. So that is roughly 1,200 properties, a little over 1,200 properties. Um, and as Sounds I said- a good question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So if someone wants to optimize or an ask me for tax payment, how do I verify that this person is actually the right person? Uh, because these, are, these people are being randomized. Every month there is a new person. Yeah. Right? So how do I know? Well, there's not a new person. So that each neighborhood will only be only receive tax collectors once in the campaign. Um, uh -huh. But there's there's so many neighborhoods that they basically and, and not enough collectors to do it all at once. So they okay. over the six months you only get one. And they do yeah. have uniforms and badges and stuff like this. They have a letter um, sort of with the government saying, you know, this is who it is. But but I think that could be a reason. I think that that's also potentially a reason why they have this strong preference for being in teams of two rather than being mm -hmm. a lone roving collector where you're kind of unsure if this person is legitimate or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Sean. Okay. Uh, yeah, Johnson. So, just want to clarify here. I think uh, usually, so the tax evasion uh, usually just uh, happens in the process of the evaluation. So here in the experiment, so when you reassign the uh, tax collectors, if the new collectors were just re-evaluate re the the properties. Yeah, that's a great question. Um... The assessment margin is a bit shut down here because it's so simplified. So it's so obvious. Um, we don't see too much action there. We can look at whether, so what we do is we send um, enumerators to all properties to get an independent assessment of the, whether it was a low or high type. And um, because it's so, we even have the pictures, so we can even have a, you know, an expert not in the field do this. And because it's so simple between the type of building material, we don't see much action on the assessment margin. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, so you mean that in your experiment, actually, they are not asked to reevaluate. They just ask to collect the tax. They well, do, no, they do they have do. to assess. They do have to assess in the first step. So when they're doing yeah. this sort of the property registration, they do, um, you know, check the, they do check the, the, the building type. So I guess that's this first step. They, they will assess the tax liability. But yeah. we look at that as an outcome uh, using our independent assessment. And we, we basically see no very few deviations from the correct assessment. Um, so they don't seem to be, this doesn't seem to be a source of collusion. Uh, it may be an outcome of the fact that these are being reshuffled a lot. You know, maybe if they were working in the same neighborhood, we would see more action here. But in this context, it doesn't seem to be uh, seem to be a, an important source of collusion. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, but uh, I still have one question here. So do yeah, the new yeah. team know the previous information about the valuation of the, the, same, oh. the same property, the historical information? No, I don't think, okay. I don't think they do. So no, all, they don't, all this yeah. evaluation just made independently every time when the new team is formed. That's right, that's right. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. that's interesting, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think that it could be probably that, that that could be part of this. Um, it's hard for people to coordinate 
and it's also hard for the um, households to to pay the bribes because they know okay once they pay this month the next month the new team will come so <laughs> Um, well, but again, there's only the teams are only coming once per year, so it's only okay. Yeah, so the the team is assigned this month, and then that neighborhood will never receive tax collectors again until the following year. Um, so the the month by month strategy is it's always different neighborhoods where they're working. If that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, what is our sources of data? We have both the sort of administrative data, which we'll use to look at um, impacts on tax. Uh, you know, all of our tax outcomes come from the admin data. Um, and then we have a series of um, surveys conducted by a set of independent enumerators, which we'll use to look at um, other secondary outcomes like bribes, as well as mechanisms. Uh, oops, that didn't, didn't work quite well. Um, <laughs> so the um, uh, to be a little more precise about what we're doing here. So you can think of collector type as the collector's um, ability to collect taxes, as we discussed before. And to be simple, we're just going to have everything discrete, so we can think of low and high type uh, collectors. Um, and then household type will be similarly the propensity to pay the property tax. And again, that will be just simply low and high propensity. So we can define a match as a triplet, so the types of the two collectors and the type of the household. So then the expected tax compliance uh, function, which is basically our production function in this context, um, will just simply be the uh, probability of tax compliance conditional on the match type. So conditional on the type of the two collectors and the type of the uh, household. So then what we do is uh, search for different assignment functions, f, um, which is just, as I said before, a probability mass function, so a distribution of these uh, match types. And we'll look at uh, the optimal um, assignment function, uh, uh, which is the, the assignment that will you know, maximize tax compliance. And we can also look at maximizing revenue or maximizing revenue net of bribes or other, other maximums. Now, when we do this optimization, we're going to um, hold constant the marginal distributions in collector and collector household type. So specifically, uh, we want to basically have two constraints. One is the, um, the non-overlapping assignment. So we don't want to assign more household, more teams to one household, which is kind of you know, going a little bit back to Sean's uh, question. Um, and second, we want to keep workload uh, the same as in the status quo. We don't want to cheat on these margins so that we can really isolate the impact of uh, assignments specifically. So that's kind of our optimal assignment problem. Um, so let me get into a little bit how we estimate this. So first, we need our estimates of household and collector type. So for household type, we use the fact that we have a nice um, pre-treatment, sort of pre-tax you know, campaign measure, where in 80 neighborhoods throughout the city, these locally embedded leaders called city chiefs um, went uh, line by line over the property register and predicted the economic ability to pay the property tax. And uh, what they did is they reviewed photographs of every property in the neighborhood. And they, they work in neighborhoods of you know, a couple hundred properties, so it's not like they're too large to know these, these things in detail. And they predicted the ability to pay, uh, whether it's unlikely, likely, or very likely to pay the property tax. Um, and this occurred in 80 neighborhoods, which here are uh, in blue, so prediction neighborhoods. Uh, these, these different neighborhoods were randomly assigned, and they correspond to the treatment arms of, a, of another um, RCT that we conducted. Um, so we're going to be leveraging that same randomization here for, for this study. Um, so we don't have those chief predictions in the red neighborhoods, but we have them in the blue neighborhoods. And so this is going to be the sample split that we're going to also exploit when we um, are estimating our collector types. The gray neighborhoods in this uh, map are ones in which the chiefs actually collected taxes themselves. Um, so we exclude those from this study because they don't have any kind of random assignment of tax collectors. Those chiefs are not randomly you know, living in the, in the neighborhoods they collected taxes in. Um, so what we'll do is um, have a sample splitting approach where we basically conduct our um, 
uh, all the analysis in the blue neighborhoods, but we're going to estimate collector type in a holdout sample, which is the red uh, neighborhoods. So the chief predictions end up being quite um, um, predictive of tax compliance. So this is the, uh, the chief's uh, predictions to unlikely, likely, and very likely. So you can see that uh, there's a strong correlation with uh, tax compliance of the households. And so what we'll do is we'll partition uh, households into high and low types by grouping uh, low types um, as unlikely and then high types as likely or very likely. Uh, it's sort of the most natural way to group this. There's also not that many very likelies. Um, so this, this ends up being sort of the most natural way to, to, to split. But note that we do have uh, 30, there's more going to be more high types than low types um, in the analysis. You'll see that reflected in some of the figures I, I'm about to show you. Uh, yeah, Simon? Uh, yes, just curious. So why there are some neighborhood uh, were collected uh, by the chief and then others are not collected by the chief? What's the, what's, what makes the difference? So that was a, a different uh, RC, a, another RCT related to this one where the question was what type of tax collector is the most uh, effective at, at increasing uh, tax compliance. Um, and so I can, I can send you my paper on that one. Uh, oh. <laughs> but we they ultimately, ultimately find that the, the chiefs end up being, uh, in fact, slightly, slightly more effective as tax collectors than the, uh, than the state collectors. Um, oh, so, so that's okay. So that's not uh, what the government did before your experiment. It's actually part of your not experiment. That's part of the experiment. Yeah, they had, oh. they had um, experimented with both types in the past, but we, we conducted an RCT with them to really formally assess that uh, those different collector types. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Can I ask a, a follow up on that? I mean, um, uh, first of all, if there are chiefs, then that suggests that there are tribal differences across this city. Um, and uh, that, that it may be common knowledge that some tribes pay better than others. Um, moreover, the chiefs, I would have thought, um, if they are chiefs, they have some capacity to penalize members of their tribe for not complying. Um, and a, a final question suggested by this, that <clears throat> do we know uh, um, how, um, how good the chiefs are at paying their own taxes? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't. I don't actually know the answer to that one offhand. I'd have to look at our data, um, but I could. I could definitely get you uh, uh, an answer on that. Um, as far as the yeah, so the chiefs they're they're not her, they're not like customary chiefs. These are city chiefs, so it's kind of an informal institution. It's, it's right. sort of like quasi. It's hereditary, but um, doesn't have the same significance as sort of traditional customary chiefs. Um, so what our other paper finds is actually the sort of threat of punishment and whatnot doesn't seem to matter too much. It's really that these guys have uh, much better information about who's a likely payer. That's how they end up collecting higher uh, tax compliance. So they target people more efficiently, um, which I guess is consistent with sort of the, the use of this in this context, which is that they are predicting uh, type for us here. And so that's consistent with their you know, status as a locally embedded uh, elite who sort of has this information that they can leverage um, to, to benefit the state in this way. OK, thanks for that. Uh, just a clarificatory question, Jonathan. So the yeah. owner's ability to pay that you're showing here is independent of the band uh, in which the household exists, right? That you showed yes. earlier. Yes. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, okay. that's a great. Thanks for clarifying that. So everything will be within band, basically. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's household types. And then for collector types, um, we're going to use this fixed effects approach. So the, the basic issue we have is we don't have any kind of pre-treatment pre estimate of these collectors' abilities. Um, we don't have how they worked in a past campaign. We don't have you know, some kind of score from their entry exams or something. So what we do is we, um, we have this sample splitting approach and we, fix, we estimate a fixed effects model in the holdout sample um, where we have you know, random assignment of the collectors. So we can look at uh, their fixed effects, the average tax compliance they achieve and use that to assess their quality. Um, so other, other things that could impact um, compliance would, would you know, on average balance out. And then we'll use those predictions from the holdout sample to run our main analysis in the um, analysis sample. So we'll estimate the tax compliance function and we'll do the um, optimal uh, assignment uh, search. 
So specifically, we're just going to fit a very simple standard uh, fixed effects um, regression. Um, everything here is pretty standard except for, uh, so this is just going to be tax compliance with dummies for uh, the, the collectors who are assigned to work in a neighborhood. The only non-standard thing is we have these fixed effects for the months because those are basically our randomization strata. Since they were re-randomized every month, so we want to include those. Um, otherwise, very standard. Um, we will cluster uh, at the neighborhood level or alternate alternatively use a Bayesian bootstrap um, to account for the fact that the estimate, these are estimates of type. These are not actually like underlying type. So the OLS uh, fixed effects are gonna be unbiased, but noisy. Um, and so we shrink them using standard sort of empirical base methods. This ends up being not very important at all because we're gonna rank them in a way I'll tell you next. Um, so the, what we do is we want to basically partition these collectors into discrete groups, just like we did the um, households. Uh, what we, to try to find how many types uh, here, we used an unsupervised machine learning approach, uh, a series of a bunch of different algorithms like the elbow method and the silhouette method. And there's general agreement across these methods that the optimal number of types in this context um, for k-means clustering is, is, uh, is two. So we, we will go forward with two, although we can show robustness to more. Um, so to define high and low types, we simply rank them uh, according to their fixed effects, and then we split at the median. Um, so very, very straightforward. Um, now it's possible that this kind of, uh, you know, by doing a fixed effects model, we're assuming this is, you know, additive and separable, and this could be a misspecific misspecification in the uh, expected tax compliance function. Um, that we don't really care so much about that because all we're doing here is trying to be, uh, you know, we're doing this non-parametrically. We're we're trying to make no assumptions about functional form in this step. Um, so we just want a sort of sensible ranking of collectors so we can then look at these counterfactual assignments. Um, but we can do some simulations and show that, you know, if you knew the actual uh, production function had complementarities and you used our approach, how often would you get it wrong? And you don't get it wrong really any more than if you had the right production function. So this. Uh, this this method seems to be you know robust to even sort of model misspecification this step. Um, so as I was saying, you know, once we um, have our our estimates of household and collector type, we can then um, non-parametrically estimate in our analysis sample where we have the chief predictions, the uh, the the average compliance function. So this just basically is putting in dummies for all the different uh, match types, where the omitted category is the low, low, low uh, match type. Again, we include these uh, month fixed effects, uh, since that's our stratification variable. And this thing will be identified under random assignment. Um, and I said, we'll alternatively cluster at the neighborhood level um, or use um, some, uh, you know, the, the uh, Bayesian bootstrap. So then once we have the estimates for the average compliance function, we can simply plug those in and search for the optimal, um, uh, the optimal assignment. So the, the, the assignment that will, uh, that will maximize tax compliance in our main specification. So first we'll characterize before showing you the sort of results of this, um, what the optimal assignment looks like according to this, uh, this, this process. I think ex ante, although I've already told you what it looks like, it wasn't totally obvious to us. So it's um, you know, if you're thinking about the collector team to household dimension, it really depends on the kind of nature of the task here. So if the, you know, if it's easy to collect from high type households and you just have to sort of show up and they pay, they're really very compliant, then you might think, well, you should just assign those to low type collectors. So some sort of negative assortative sort of matching would be, would be better. Um, on the other hand, if collecting from the high types is still challenging, then, you know, it's probably better to, uh, to have uh, more of a, you know, there might be complementarities that might be positive sort of matching. Similarly, with forming collector teams, a lot of bureaucratic tasks are such that you just need to sort of box ticking exercise. You need to make sure one skilled person is, is present, and then you can, um, you know, you can sort of forget about the lazy ones. So it's, maybe you have a series of patronage hires and you sort of spread out and uh, minimize the negative impact. So I think this is actually, there's a couple recent papers that find that negative assortative matching often occurs in bureaucracies because of the nature of these tasks. So it's not obvious that you wouldn't want, you know, mixed teams having low and high types together rather than uh, homogeneous teams. Uh, but if there is scope for, you know, some sort of complementarity, like in 
collect your skills or effort, then you know you'd want uh, positive assertive matching. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I see the question. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jonathan, yeah, you mentioned that these collectors are paid by piece rate, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you have a team that has one high type, one low type, they pair up, and then they manage to successfully collect tax from this property, how are they get paid? Are they get paid the same or different? Um, well, if they're working together all the time, um, then they will, and they follow the, there's a policy, a sort of norm where they alternate collections and they should get paid the same. Uh, but there's nothing stopping the high type from say, working longer hours or something, in which case they would collect all the additional um, revenue from, from houses they visit. Uh, so, the, so the rotation, or tech, rotation. taking turns is is it's been instructed by the experiment or they decide yeah. how they do it that's that's the that's the norm in the in the tax ministry and so maybe surprisingly we see it observed very closely so we can see in the data the timestamps of the payments and they 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 do observe that norm um but that was just something the government sort of advised them to do yeah i'm thinking along the way like is there any possibility that this could be some free writing yeah. Uh, same going on. Uh, it's hard to. I mean, I guess potentially if the low type, um, you know, gets the high type to enter their code for them, they could still benefit. But it would depend on convincing the high type to to do that for them, even if they're not present. Um, so it's possible, but it would. I think it's pretty unlikely given the incentives. Um, Moreover, we just don't see the we don't see them working on their own very much. So they have sort of have to be present. Um, so maybe there's a, a, a type of free writing where you're just kind of there in the background, not really doing much. Um, but okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so to characterize the uh, optimal assignment, first, this is the random assignment. So I'm going to show a bunch of uh, graphs like this where you have uh, the collector teams are shown as low, 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 high, and high, high. Uh, same for, you know, partitioned here for low type households and high type households. So this is the random assignment. You can see as expected, the mixed teams are twice as likely because of random assignment. And then you have more high type households because of the nature of those chief predictions. There were more uh, likelies and very likelies than unlikelies. And then by contrast, here is the optimal assignment where you again, observe positive assertive matching. Um, you want to give all of the uh, high type households first to um, high, high collector teams. So you give no low type households to high, high collector teams. And then you want to give all uh, low type households to uh, low, low collector teams. Um, uh, but there's still some high type uh, households left over because there's more of them. And so you give low, low type, uh, low, low collector teams also some, uh, some high types because there's just too many of them. And so this is showing the estimates of the uh, production function, the average tax compliance function. So um, again, the, the type of the pair, um, low, 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 high, 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 and then the uh, type of the household. So you can see that this exhibits um, complementarities in collector type. So if you, you know, go from having two low type collectors to low high, there's a small maybe increase in compliance, but then if you add another high type collector to uh, a mixed team, you, you observe a much larger uh, increase in, in, in uh, expected tax compliance. So in other words, this thing looks convex and collector type and we can sort of show uh, more formally that this does, you can reject um, uh, you know, uh, linearity. This basically you find increasing uh, differences here. Similarly, you have these complementarities in collector to household type. Um, so if you look at you know, what's the benefit to assigning to a low, low team, a high type household relative to a low type household, maybe that's four percentage points. Uh, but look at the comparison for a high, high, high team, the benefit of giving a high type household relative to a low type household is more like 14 percentage points, so a much bigger increase. And again, we can show that this is convex in collector to household type, and you exhibit these uh, increasing uh, differences. So where do these complementarities come from? This is getting into sort of the mechanisms. We consider two possibilities. One is collector skills and one is collector effort. Um, so it's possible that pairing these two collect high type collectors together works because they, they have some sort of persuasive skill or 
charisma or uh, maybe targeting ability that is necessary to get people to pay. And when you have two of them, they're just systematically better. Um, we don't observe too much evidence consistent with this. So we, we, the way we look at this is by looking at end-line um, end perceptions of the probability of sanctions, for instance. So if this all operates through more convincing collector teams, then you should see at, at end line, those households assigned to high, high collector teams would have systematically higher beliefs about the probability of enforcement than uh, other you know, households assigned to high, low or low, low collector team. Um, but we don't see uh, really much evidence of that. So there's no kind of corresponding convexity here. Um, we similarly look at sort of different messages used by tax collectors. So uh, don't find anything there. Uh, the effort story is a bit more the kind of standard peer effect story where having two high types together, they just are able to motivate each other and, and exert higher effort. Um, and so we do find some evidence consistent with that. You see that if you use the our estimates on sort of payment dates and uh, a few other sort of administrative pieces of, of data that we have on time spent collecting, you observe that the high, high teams are collecting systematically more. And you see that sort of familiar convex pattern. Um, so this is consistent with, you know, uh, the sort of effort, uh, longer hours being, being, uh, being the mechanism here. Um, we can also show that if you use a different source of data on visits, uh, tax um, visits reported by households, you see a similar um, increase, um, especially on the intensive margin. So how many times they go back after the registration step. So one question is, well, okay, what is it about you know, longer working hours, it actually causes households to pay taxes more. One possibility is this is that this, you know, that more times a collector comes to my doorstep, I start to really believe, okay, it's necessary, I have to pay this tax. Um, so some kind of causal effect on beliefs. Uh, but again, we, we've we looked at, you know, some sort of, you know, the probability of enforcement, and, and there doesn't seem to be impacts on the expected uh, probability of enforcement. Um, so another alternative is this just relaxes cash on hand constraints, which are, you know, quite an important thing for lumpy, you know, property tax payments. Even in the U.S. and Mexico, we have good good evidence that uh, liquidity constraints matter quite a lot for these for compliance. And you'd think that in you know a place like DRC, this would matter even more. So the logic is that you know by uh, visiting more times or by visiting at different times of the day, you could reach uh, uh, taxpayers, potential taxpayers, at times they have the ability to pay the tax, the liquidity to pay the tax. And that could account for the uh, increase in compliance. So we do find that the um, complementarities we observe, they only exist in neighborhoods with higher employment rates, where you have you know, people with sort of more cash on hand, most likely. Uh, we also find that these uh, teams are actually collecting somewhat systematically later in the day. Um, so the blue one here is going to be the high, high teams relative to the low, high, and the, and the low, low. Um, and so it's possible that in a, in a setting where you have a lot of people sort of you know, getting wages uh, that day, in the afternoon, you have uh, a better chance of finding people with the cash on hand to pay the tax. Um, so both of those are consistent with uh, this sort of cash on hand uh, story. But that doesn't really get to the bottom of the puzzle, which is that, well, why wouldn't everyone just do this? It's not exactly rocket science. And in fact, the, uh, the, the trainers, the, the top tax authority um, officials did emphasize, you know, you want to go back multiple times to try to get people uh, to pay the tax. So what we think is really going on is this is sort of like a coordination problem, um, where if either a collector is late or flaky or leaves early, then both of them, you know, don't bother collecting. And they basically production goes to zero. So in other words, this production function has a kind of O-ring property where um, if either collector you know, isn't there, no one collects taxes, um, owing to this strong norm of having both people, uh, which may have to do with the sort of safety issue, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So in short, uh, high, high teams uh, seem to be able to solve this uh, collective action sort of coordination problem. They visit households, especially the high types um, at different times of day, they're more likely to visit them multiple times. And this seems to allow for those liquidity constraints to uh, not bind at the time of visit for higher uh, compliance. Uh, yeah, Sean. Hey, Jonathan, so a related question. So here, uh, do you know what exact, how exactly these uh, team members collaborate with each other within the team? For example, so if the team just uh, collects the tax from 10 households, then do they actually Okay, so the team member 
A just uh, collect from five and the member B okay, collect in another five or just they work together. Okay, simultaneously, yeah. okay, for the, these 10 households. Uh, do, do you know exact yeah. information about how they coordinate? Yeah, so they work together. There's not some, they don't seem to divide up households. Um, we can, we see that in the, uh, in the end line survey, we asked them, you know, was it one person or two? And it's almost always two, um, very high percentage of times. Um, and so I think, again, this, this reflects this, this, uh, desire to be together because they feel safer, they feel stronger, they feel more credible and sort of taking people's money and rather than just a lone, a lone ranger kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's two of you, you feel more sort of legitimate in, in, in claiming this money will go to the state. Yeah, but I was thinking whether this could be a channel uh, for you not to find the uh, significant effect on the corruption because you have two people show up and then- Oh, because uh, you're monitoring each other basically? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it is possible that. Um, I mean, certainly that's a sort of a standard logic: is that the larger the team or organization, the harder it is to cover collusion. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Also, there could be a on the job learning effect here, right? So if two yeah. pay up together, one is high tide, one is low. You know, the, the low bidding one, even starting with low productivity, we could learn something a thing or two from the high productivity guy, because they work together for several uh, collections, yeah. not just one, right? Yeah, that's, this is a great point, because in, in some ways, this could, this could really screw up our, our estimates, because if there is learning that would go on with mixed teams, then by fully doing positive assortative matching, you would mess up that learning. Um, so let me hold that one and I'll show you that's not the case uh, in a few slides, but that's, I think, a really crucial, uh, crucial point. Yeah. yeah. And another um, quick uh, related question is um, yeah. uh, we, we need to bear in mind, I think, that they're, they're only getting 10% of the potential revenue, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so the success rate um, overall is very low. Uh, so yeah. my question then is, given this uh, uh, high, high link to high quality households, um, what is the collection rate for that combination? Uh, when you have high highs going to high value households, is the collection rate in that case very high or is it still quite low? Um, I, believe, um, I believe for that specific combination, it ends up being something like 16 or 18 percent i believe yeah, it's um, still very yeah. low isn't it? yeah 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 it's still quite low um, yeah. yeah yeah so um yeah and whether that means that overall the effort level for these guys is not very great um yeah and even though it might be better than alternative people or i think that's right means, yeah. yeah whether it means that some of the corruption deals are that you know well, we won't report any revenue from you uh, but uh, you and we can simply divide funds, right? So that mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, um, and otherwise you'll be left alone. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. So there, but it, it does seem to me there's a lot of potential here for uh, a, a, a kind of bit of game theoretic analysis. I would think um, when you've got the state, you've got two individuals, and you've got the payer all negotiating uh, amongst themselves. Um, and yeah. what, are the, what are the issues that are going to bring about an equilibrium in that case? Um, yeah, and, it's interesting. We have a, I have another paper where we, we really focus more on uh, bribery and we sort of think about splitting the surplus and whatnot. We, we also do a lot of validation techniques of different measurements of mm -hmm. bribe, uh, bribe payment. And I do think the, the rate of bribe payment is not terrifically high in this case because the bargaining power of the collector is not terribly high either as evidenced by the low compliance rate to begin with um but mm. uh but let me let me let me um sure. return okay. to Thanks that in just that. a few slides yeah yeah um so yeah just our, our basic kind of estimated impact sorry, of this uh, counterfactual okay. optimal yeah. So yeah let me ask then quickly I mean, for example me is i mean suppose this high high type cost more to the state i mean this extra effort compensates to pay a higher wage for them or not Yes, I mean they would have to pay a proportionally higher share of the revenue, but it's still it's still beneficial. Um, you know, the it's a it's a share, so they're still getting quite a bit more revenue um, from them. 
So we'll we'll also look at a we'll also look at a comparison policy where you just increase the share of the revenue that is paid. So you basically make those performance wages even stronger, stronger incentives. Um, and that one ends up backfiring in terms of net revenue because you're, you know, the, the sort of elasticity of compliance is going to be not uh, large enough to offset the sort of mechanical payout of, of the wages. Um, but that's not the case when we're looking at just the high, high techs. But it could potentially, could, potentially could be problematic, right? Unless the tax officer can enforce the assignment. Because essentially everybody wants to go to the high payer, uh, the they, they, uh, household with a high propensity to pay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it does require the um, some degree of uh, ability to control the um, the employees and where they're where they're going. They have to respect the, the assignments. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So our, our basic um, estimate of the impact here is about uh, just close to three percentage points increase, uh, which ends up being a thirty-seven percent uh, increase relative to the status quo. Um, and as I kind of alluded to, this comes equally from both dimensions of assignments. So the collector to collector dimension and then the collector to household uh, dimension. Um, uh, and, and so if you only had access to one of these, you could do about half as well. I'm going to go a little bit fast, just looking at the time here. I want to um, just get through a few last points. Um, so the robustness exercises, uh, I, I sort of mentioned we can show robustness to more types of collectors. We can also look at different ways of you know, defining the type of, of collector. So using household uh, or using collector demographics, which you know, maybe is easier for the state uh, if it's a low capacity state and can't run a fixed effects model. Um, alternatively, uh, another definition of household type. So maybe you don't have these chiefs. So maybe the chiefs aren't willing to coordinate. Uh, and so if that's the case, uh, you can just predict using household characteristics. And actually the estimated impacts of these policies are, are pretty good, um, uh, are pretty similar to our main specification. Um, we also look at uh, revenue maximization, which I think was related to one of the points we were just discussing about um, you know, how much is actually retained by the government. Um, so there's still a, this, uh, the same sort of revenue uh, impact. Um, we look at a neighborhood level assignment rather than a household level assignment it might be quite important for sort of logistical, you know, tax administration regions. Maybe you want this to get too costly uh, in terms of tax administration. Uh, and we do almost as well uh, in when we just rely on the neighborhood level assignment. We also have a um, report uh, sort of median unbiased estimates using a methodology from Andrews et al, um, where we correct for the winner's curse. Um, so because we're doing the estimation of the expected tax compliance function and searching for our optimal policy in the same sample, there could be sort of overfitting issues. Um, we don't find too much evidence of that, which I think makes sense because ultimately our regression has like you know, five dummies in it. So it's not like there's all that many degrees of freedom to fit noise. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, we, we do implement that. We also have recently added um, an alternative methodology completely, something from Stefan Bonhomme on uh, a, a sort of nonlinear approach to uh, estimating heterogeneity and complementarities when you have team level outcomes. Um, uh, and this is, fortunately, it's quite reassuring. So we also find uh, a high degree of positive sort of matching and the, uh, the optimal policy looks, looks, looks very similar. And then finally, I just wanted to return to this uh, question that Simon was raising about, you know, uh, endogenous responses. So there's a couple different possibilities. You know, one is sort of endogenous responses and effort. So maybe there's kind of a demoralization story um, where the collectors, the low types are bummed out. They're only working with other low types or other, uh, other you know, only going to low type households. I think that was kind of implicit a little bit. And I think it was Rod's point. I may be forgetting who, who made that point. Um, but we, we can look at this basically because we have the, you know, each month they work with a different share of uh, either other low type collectors or, other, or a share of low type households. And so we can show that, you know, past assignments to low type teammates and low type households doesn't seem to, to predict sort of end line levels of low motivation or dropping out. Um, and we can also show that, you know, even if you did have high degrees of dropout, you still would have a pretty, a pretty large uh, effect from the optimal policy um, because these low types are contributing so little actually to the, uh, to the, to the revenue. Um, 
So uh, I, can, I can go through those in more detail if you want, but I wanted to get to the learning ones, which is what uh, Simon was asking about. So one possibility is that the second point is that you, know, you can learn from high types. This is what Simon was pointing out, that maybe you know, the low types in early rounds of collection could be paired with a skilled collector. They could learn from them and they could get better and become maybe a high type themselves in round three or four. Uh, and so by creating these sort of segregated, you know, all low type, all high type teams, you would kill that process of learning. So it would be an important possible sort of backfiring or sort of, you know, equilibrium uh, or, you know, an endogenous learning sort of story that would be problematic for our estimation. Um, again, we can leverage the fact that we see these, these different um, uh, collectors working together. We have this sort of repeated month structure to, to actually test this. Um, so what we find here um, is that, uh, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, my links are not working perfectly. Uh, let me see if I can get this one. Hmm. Uh, well, we basically, let me just summarize, because I'm not sure if I can find you the table right now for some reason. Um, but what we find is that the, in fact, the learning from high type collectors, it does occur. Um, and it occurs most uh, strongly the previous round, which I think makes sense. But interestingly, it's most pronounced among the high type collectors, not the low type collectors. So in other words, being assigned to another high type is most valuable for other high type collectors rather than other low type collectors. So if anything, this means that we may be underestimating the impact of the optimal policy because actually forming those high, high teams is gonna be even more valuable than we may be uh, estimating it to be. So there's some kind of sharing or learning that's going on that is, that is more pronounced among just the high type collectors. Um, so sorry, I can't find that one right now. Um, Okay, so here's the bribe results um, where we show, okay, yes, there is a small kind of maybe uptick in, in bribe amounts, um, but if you sort of calculate per visit, uh, there's no statistically significant increase because these high type collectors are just doing more total visits. Um, I'm not going to show you effects on these other outcomes just for the sake of time, only a couple minutes here. Uh, one thing is that this uh, uh, implementing the optimal assignment would also be sort of progressivity enhancing uh, because you're sort of shifting towards more valuable properties uh, being, being the ones uh, paying taxes. Um, and so just in the last uh, minutes here, let me show you these um, alternative counterfactual policies that we look at. So one kind of in the teacher value added literature, you know, there's often this exercise, well, what, how many teachers we need to replace and, and sort of uh, how much labor would you need to reallocate? So we, we do a similar exercise here where we say, well, how much of the labor, um, the assignments of the low types would you have to shift to the high types to get a similar sized increase as the one we estimate from the optimal assignment? policy. So it turns out you'd have to reallocate about 62% of that work. Uh, and that doesn't, you know, take into account, you know, potentially exhaustion or being overworked. Um, so that seems like a pretty large number to us. Um, also for just hiring new uh, collectors at, at the average um, ability level, you could actually never do as well as the, um, as the optimal assignment policy. Um, similarly, if you just jack up their performance-based wages, um, you, you can't really do as well in revenue terms because as I was discussing before, just paying those higher wages is gonna kind of eventually offset the increase in, um, in, in tax compliance that you observe. Um, so I think that's all that I have here. So just to take stock uh, and to conclude, the field experiment we study uh, had these two dimensions of random assignment. We used those to characterize the optimal assignment. We found um, positive assertive matching on both uh, dimensions. We found that these uh, complementarities likely reflect uh, these tax collectors solving a kind of coordination problem and being able to do more visits, work longer and visit people uh, at times when their liquidity constraints were not binding. Um, and we found that the impact uh, of this counterfactual policy would increase compliance by about 37%. Um, and so in some, we would suggest this uh, this, this margin of bureaucrat assignment as a, as a useful sort of resource neutral tool that can help low capacity states increase uh, their fiscal capacity. So thanks uh, very much for your questions and the discussion. Um, and let me know if there's any last questions. I'm happy to stay longer if there are. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. Very fascinating results and was a perfect time management. So officially, so I think our seminar uh, comes to an end here, but I think uh, if uh, Jonathan, 
doesn't mind. So we can still uh, stay in Zoom for more questions. Yeah, I think Simon and Tusha both have questions. Simon? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Jonathan. That's a very fascinating mm -hmm. work. And uh, uh, so I, I just have this last question. So you started out by motivating the study, talking about how difficult it is for the government to uh, you know, motivate their employees because there are a lot of constraints. And one of the constraints is that these, uh, these tend to be lifetime employment. You know, you can't just fire them. So they have this strong job security incentive there. Uh, in your experiment, these tax collector, if I remember correct, they are contractors. Do they enjoy the same level of the job security as the regular government employee in that country? Yeah, that's a great point. And there is a, I agree, there's a bit of a tension there. We, um, it, so they, they don't, I mean, they're not full-time salaried uh, employees. Um, and so, um, you know, I guess, I guess my response to that would be these types of uh, contracts that we're studying are quite common in developing countries. So at least in this context, which I know well, and I know a number of recent papers that I've seen, you know, that the, it's a, it's a very similar story for the ways that governments kind of hire for these types of large campaigns. They, they have these sort of, um, you know, frequent contractors who do work for different parts of the government. And, um, and you know, I, I think that it is analogous in the sense that these are kind of like, they would be bureaucrats if the government had uh, larger revenue, but it just doesn't have the ability to take them on as a salary agents yet. Um, so, you know, so it, 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 should, it should be clear that the external validity would apply more to this type of agent rather than to, you know, the, the sort of standard bureaucrat. And so I take your point that there's a, there's a tension there with the, the, the first slide. Yeah, thanks. A couple of questions, Jonathan. So the first one is, I'm trying to reconcile what, what you showed us today with the other paper that you mentioned, where the chiefs were better at collecting taxes. Uh, the, the red, the gray region, actually, right? So if the chiefs are better at collecting taxes, then basically, and they usually would be going alone because there's only one chief, right? So I, I struggle to see the incentive to go in team. I mean, even from a game theory point of view, if I know that some households will definitely pay and some households will not, I, for me, if I'm a corrupt individual, it makes sense to go alone, right? I mean, it makes sense to take that entire amount that they'll compensate me with and have it for myself right so so how does these two fit together right um you, you mentioned that the that there are costs involved in terms of the safety in traveling alone um, but is that enough to counteract the other incentive of you know me being alone going alone and pocketing all the money for myself all the bribe for myself right yeah the second one okay, so quickly the second one is so we have been thinking a lot about tax compliance but but in terms of the cost side of this, right? So um, obviously this assignment of tax collectors every month, or even if it happens every six months, is not going to be costless, right? There has to be a cost uh, involved in doing that. On top of that, this, you also have to kind of think of it from the household's point of view that, you know, if, it, if they're just paying this extra tax because they're trying to avoid the nuisance cost of somebody coming to their household every day, then what are they taking the money away from, right? Given that this is a low income you know, context, perhaps it's getting away from education or health, right? So in terms of the general equilibrium uh, aspects of things, um, is there a way you could evaluate that? What happens to the household welfare uh, in these neighborhoods? Yeah, those are my two questions. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um... So on like the welfare impacts of this, uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a broader, it's, it's obviously a challenging thing to measure well. Um, we do look at the effects on, you know, payments for like end line levels of income, consumption, uh, kind of standard, you know, oh, we even have like perceived well-being and things like that. So we don't see any effects on those types of outcomes. Um, it could be that these are just really noisy measures. Um, so I can't give you a perfect answer on what you know this budget 
you know, what's, what is going down as payment is going up. Um, I, I do think that like, if we just accept the fact that the government needs some resources and has a revenue requirement and there's some welfare cost to that in society, then I think this policy that we're looking at is going to be comparatively an improvement because it ends up being pro progressivity enhancing. So we end up shifting the burden of compliance on a relatively richer, higher value set of properties. So, you know, that is resting on an assumption that maybe you're uncomfortable with, but if we accept that first premise that the government needs to, you know, incur some welfare costs to raise its, to reach its revenue requirement, I think this comparative counterfactual policy is attractive. Um, on the first point, um, so the chiefs in this context also have assistance. So they also work in pairs actually for what it's worth. They weren't working alone. Uh, we also don't find, we do find and slightly higher um, rates of bribes for chiefs, which I guess maybe that's consistent with your intuition. Um, even though they're not working alone, maybe they have, you know, a bit of, um, they're less closely monitored. They're going to the tax authority less often. You know, they're not actually employed directly by the tax authority, even though their, uh, their, their bonuses are the same. Um, the overall rate of bribes is still quite low as far as we can measure it. Um, again, according to quite a few different measures that we validate. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's kind of some off the cuff responses. It's an interesting series of, of questions about, you know, why do they work in teams and how important is collusion? My own intuition is that, you know, in this context, because there's such a low rate of tax compliance in the first place, they're really trying to kind of initiate meaningful levels of tax payments for the first time, you know, really, I mean, it was like zero in 2015 among these, these property owners. Um, I think the... Uh, they just have so little bargaining power. That's not really the crucial margin. I think it's much more the desire to, you know, represent a strong and competent face to tax payers. That's why they have this preference to work in teams, um, as well as possibly being concerned about carrying a lot of money in these some of these neighborhoods where they might, you know, have like safety issues. Actually, um, oh, it could just I think that's the, uh, yeah, yeah. the fact that one will draft the other one out. Right. I mean. So you it could be, but thing. I mean that yeah. that depends on there being, uh, you know, there being sort of more ability to to collect, you know, the the bribes. But yeah, I see I see your point. I mean, it's definitely a stand. It's a it's a prediction of a lot of you know important models. So I agree with you on the sort of theoretical intuition. Yeah. Thank you. Great paper. Yeah. Thank you. Rod, please. Oh, uh, I would. I just wanted to follow up on how you actually measured the bribes, whether or not when you do mention that you checked it out. Um, from several different angles, but uh, um, do we really know how much in the way of bribes um, is being collected in this instance? I mean, can you give us some sort of confidence enhancing sense of that? Yeah, so we ask, um, the main, my preferred measure is, uh, did you pay the transport or the pay a coffee or pay a tea for the tax collector? Mm -hmm. These are kind of local codes for paying a bribe. Um, and I did a past paper in the context of uh, roadway tolls where bribe payment is super common and uh, you know, up to 50, 60% of people pay bribes instead of taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, we did a bunch of different mechanisms. Some, you know, some we, we had um, randomized response, we had this local code, we had you know, direct amounts, we had estimating what others are doing, you know, kind of all the ways that people do this. And, we could show that they all kind of line up, but the, I think the most precise one was this using the local code. Um, so that's that's the preferred one we're using in this context. Um, we also have a have a um, a measure for sort of missing payments. So if the if the household reports a payment, like I paid anything at all, we can then compare that with the admin data to look at whether there's a gap between the two, which might be sort of like a measure of corruption, uh, pocketing the money, um, and so. You was know, that significant, that particular measure? Uh, that one is, um, it, it, it may be marginally significant for this paper. Mm -hmm. I'm actually forgetting mm -hmm. offhand. Um, but I guess if you were the collector um, and you knew the household was going to report payment, then you would probably contribute some portion of that to the states to avoid that mismatch, I guess. Well, there's no incomplete payment, so they have to pay fully, um, mm. which in some ways you might think would even fuel bribes even more, uh, because if you only have 
you know, a quarter of the amount, you, know, you could give that to the collector because the collector can't actually issue a receipt for that. Um, mm -hmm. But the still, when we use that other measure, I was t I was saying about the gap between the you know self report and the admin. If we if we do that per visit, uh, then we see no tr no impacts on that measure. So I think mm -hmm. it's still kind of this mechanical result of higher effort levels and more and more right. more visits. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Sam, please. Uh, okay. I I just have a very simple question about the composition of the team. So um, do you, are you interested in the gender mix in the team? Um, so, um, and also another composition is you have two people in the team. Um, have you thought about say, well, you say more people will be better for tax collection. So if you add another member in the team, would it be better? So for tax collection. Oh, like three, so there's, three members. there's a gender yeah. and then the number of people in the team. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't think I can really answer the second part because we don't have any teams that were three. So yeah, I don't I don't think I can tell you anything there, unfortunately. I'd have to see if maybe some prior work looks at varying the team size. Um, maybe given a on, gun. Well, maybe what was given that? a gun. Maybe yeah. even then yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a different policy to evaluate. Um, on gender, we have so few women that it's it's really hard to do that. Also, actually, there's it's really men who have self-selected into this job. Um, so I think it's what did I say? Is it? I remember you said ninety percent are male, so ten percent are female. Is it ten percent? Yeah. Okay, ten yeah. percent. Yeah, so uh, I think we did look at whether mixed teams are advantageous on that, and we don't see that that um, that seems all that predictive um, of compliance, you know, either up or down. Um, we also looked at sort of ethnicity, and this came up earlier, like with regard to the chiefs and sort of tribal differences, and whether because you could imagine some kind of horizontal differentiation of collectors, and whether kind of teams that are co-ethnic would collaborate yeah. better, co communicate better. We don't see too much there. I think I think it's because in this setting, the it's it's like seventy. I think it's like seventy to seventy five percent one ethnicity. So uh, there's kind of a clear majority, and then a bunch of smaller minorities. And in the collectors, they're maybe even more more skewed towards the majority. So we don't see too much action on these types of um, other horizontal sort of traits when we're looking at team composition. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah, so Jonathan, so uh, I'm just wondering, so people, okay, the readers of your paper may be still be um, interested in about the uh, more stories about corruption, probably, because I think the your experiment setting is uh, very close to the uh, that of uh, Ratnan, Kwaja, and uh, Ben Oaken, right, so their QJ paper. So they found a okay, uh, significant effect of this uh, performance-based uh, salary and uh, the corruption in Pakistan, but here okay, you don't. I think, yes, uh, I, I trust your result, but I think I, it might be better to let us know what is the mechanism, what is the specific uh, experiment setting uh, that make your experiment, you do not find the corruption. I think that is also a kind of contribution because in the end, by making comparison between your experiment and their experiment, we understand a more fundamental, okay, uh, incentives uh, in the game so that uh, uh, we can rule out or, or, or prevent to some extent the, the corruption. I think that there could be several factors here. So for example, high turnover rates here in your experiment and also the teamwork. Um, I don't know further, for example, whether people are just from, from local or from, uh, from other regions, some, something like this. I think it might be interesting to know more about the background uh, that could be related to corruption. Yeah, that's great. No, that's a good point. And we should, I think you're right that people will immediately think of that paper. And we presented this uh, when Ben Olkin was in the audience and he definitely pushed us pretty hard on the assessment mm -hmm. margin. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the key thing is this uh, kind of in our going back to our discussion earlier, this rotation of collectors, and they don't have the prior assessments. Um, 
So they they do it from scratch. So the, the chance yeah. you know, we're really kind of breaking that chance for yeah. collusion between collect you know inspector and household. That was the key thing in their in their in their paper where they looked at all the bribes and, and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so we should make that clear that 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 sort of is, is killed right off the bat by the design and the lack of a existing sort of database here. Yeah, I think there's very uh, several very interesting, maybe not intentional, but I think the experiment setting just prevents the corruption there, right? So, like uh, what I asked, the in that case they just uh, evaluate the collect, they just evaluate the property once and for all, they just stick to the household, they collect the tax and form the uh, relatively long-term relationship with the uh, taxpayers. But in your case, it, it is not the case. The team, okay, the team members they monitor each other. And they have a high turnover rate, and also is also not a profitable or, or just a, uh, it's not yeah. good for the uh, household to pay the bribes to these guys because they will leave next year, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that the, the many uh, specifications in your in your experiment that make your uh, experiment uh, different from from theirs, and uh, that's yeah. one yeah. of the reasons you do not find the corruption that that people may may be interested. Uh, interested to know why. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's also very relevant um, moving forward because one of the current projects we're doing with the tax authority is uh, coming up with a, an easier way to assess properties. So they're going to move beyond this uh, very simplified tax structure to having um, a, you know, a more, a more progressive uh, approach based on more continuous estimates of property value. Um, so that's kind of the current approach. And that's going to that's gonna mean that those tax collectors have some prior you know, value when they visit a, uh, you know, a property. And there may be scope for the kind of uh, discretion and collusion that come up in the con Olkin context. So I think that's a great, great point to also anticipate you know, some of the issues that will arise from this policy change in, in Congo. Yeah, can, yeah, can yeah. I ask, yeah. did you ask the collectors what does a failure look like in this case? Given that we, you know, uh, they're, they're successful on a minority of occasions, right? So, uh, so they're confronting these high value households. Um, most of the time they're getting nothing or nothing is being recorded. So what does a failure look like? Does the household yeah. just simply say, I'm sorry, I can't pay or, and then they walk away or is there yeah, is something it's more complicated going on? It's seldom that I won't pay. It's seldom I refuse to pay. It's always, you know, sure I'll pay, but you have to come back another time. You know, I don't have the money to pay on me right now. So that's how they, that's mm -hmm. how non, that's what non-compliance looks like, quite literally. Mm -hmm. um, and and then this calls the importance of having the collectors go back at times when they have the cash on hand. But of course, it's going to be prohib prohibitively costly at some level to have people go back a million times, you know, when it's only, cause right. it's just going to be the transport, you know what I mean? So this is actually one of the reasons why the chiefs end up being quite good collectors because they have this ability to better target their visits, both based on the propensity of households. So they know which types and then also the optimal timing. Mm -hmm. And so they can save those sort of administrative tax costs and maximize, you know, tax compliance. That's one of the reasons why in our other paper that we find that the chiefs are, are quite good at collecting taxes. All right. But, uh, but in, in, in my own personal case, I mean, I'm never liquid enough to pay my annual property tax. Um, and uh, I can't blame people in Africa for not being liquid enough either on, on these yeah. occasions. Um, yeah. But I, I had thought that, that mobile phone technology is pretty prolific in Africa. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And there are mechanisms to use that for, for make payment. Uh, is, yeah. is that yeah. not considered? It is. And it's, uh, it's another, I just submitted a grant two days ago uh, to, uh, to study a project very much based on uh, timing of taxation and using payment plans and mobile phone technology, mobile payment sort of technologies, because it's even in DRC, these types of, you know, M-Pesa and other kind of applications are very widely used. And so, as you're saying, that could really help sort of spread the, the burden of payment. And um, there's a nice recent paper also in Mexico uh, by Ann Brockmeyer and colleagues looking at different policies in which the government could help relieve these liquidity constraints in a middle income country. Um, so I do think that's a really important sort of area for right, research yeah. and policymakers. Yeah. 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 Good luck with that research. And thanks very much for your seminar. It's very good. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a, it was a real pleasure. I, I really enjoyed the discussions. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And thanks, everyone's questions and comments. I think it is very, very uh, heated uh, discussion and I think very good feedback. Uh, it is a very important topic uh, and uh, on tax capacity. And uh, what's that? I think not, not only on tax uh, capacity, I think the main contribution generally is just the, the productivity or efficiency of these uh, bureaucratic uh, organizations. Uh, it is, I think it is a very important topic in that regard as well. Yeah, thanks Thank so you. much, Jonathan. We have Thank learned a lot. At least I learned a lot. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully, if we have questions or comments, we can still contact with you and send you. First. Yes, our questions. Yes, I think you still have some ongoing yep. project following this experiment, right? Yep, absolutely. And there's okay. my email yeah. on the screen. So thanks, everyone. Really, really nice to you. Thank you, I hope you enjoy comments. your stay in Hong Kong and have yeah. some dinner. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Long, Thank you very yeah. much. How long will, this, uh, will, be, uh, will you be staying there? Uh, another six days. So we're in day Not two of seven, seven nights, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, but you are in a hotel for seven days. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. It's dire, but you know, we'll do our best. I have an exercise bike, so that helps. <laughs> they do deliver yeah. things, I hope. <laughs> you just get yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. You just to get the they, break even point. Seven days in a hotel, seven days outside. Hotel. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All okay. right. Thank you so much. Thank you so Jonathan. much. Yeah. Okay. Wish you have a, a good lunch. Yeah. So thank you. Bye. Thanks very much. Take bye. care. Bye.